Hey everybody, welcome to Call Camp, the Polar Vortex edition here, January, late January 2019. If you're listening recorded later on, just be happy you're not in the Midwest right now, or in DC for that matter. I'm Steve Richard. I'll be your uh, your coach for today with my longtime friend and uh, now a very successful founder of Tenbound. Man, I, I remember when David, you and I were talking about you founding Tenbound like a few years back when you were still working for a company and kind of had the dream, but it seems like you've really fulfilled that dream now. What? Uh, tell us about your event you got coming up here real quick. Yeah, Steve, thanks for letting me play. You're an inspiration. You always have been. I've got stories, but I'm not going to waste everybody's time. Thanks for joining us, everybody. <laughs> um, You're not telling them. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I got a quick one, so maybe at the end. Um, so yeah, I'm David Delaney with Tenbound. Uh, we do sales uh, development, training, and consulting with folks mo mainly in the Bay, but um, kind of expanding to different parts around the country. And our big event is the Sales Development Conference, which is the first and only conference 100% focused on sales development. So really excited. This is the third year, and uh, we've added a track. We always have the leadership and strategy track uh, for sales development leaders. Uh, we have a rep track for uh, obviously SDRs, BDRs, some of the best sales trainers in the world, um, running them through their uh, best practices. And then this year we're adding revenue operations. So sales operations, marketing operations, you know, the folks that keep things running on the back end and keep us on track. Uh, we're gonna have some of the best uh, thought leaders in the world really right there in San Francisco, August 23rd. Um, hope you could join us. So thanks, Steve. Thanks for letting me play. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to have you. It's a, it's cool to see how that conference has grown. And I, I have yet to hear anybody who goes that comes back that doesn't say, wow, um, that was really great, especially as it pertains to top of funnel. So uh, remember everyone tweet us at hashtag call camp. We make this more of a conversation. It's more interactive. Uh, type comments, ask questions, do the poll. Speaking of the poll, we're going to open up the poll here. Let's go. Come on. Take action here. What's not? Come on, you, Sam. I'm telling everybody to vote. That's what I'm talking about. Sam's like, oh my God, I get it. Get the poll open. What's your fall off rate? So, um, and you know, it's it's funny. We talk about this topic as it pertains to uh, a sales development rep, a business development rep. But the reality is that there are a lot of people who close their own deals that schedule not just first appointments but subsequent appointments. There are customer success people that are scheduling appointments for themselves all the time, they have a fall off rate too. We tend to focus more on what that fall off rate looks like for um, you know, a front end BDR, BDA, SDR, LDR kind of role, ADR, pick your pick your three letter, letter acronym and throw it out there. By the way, David, my my initials actually are SDR. I don't know how that happened, but maybe I'm predetermined to be doing this it shit. It was fate. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. So anyway, um, percentage of meetings that don't happen is originally scheduled. Vote, vote, vote. And we'll take a look at what those look like. Sam, do we have enough data here? Are we good? I think we're good. So the interesting thing is 30% are reporting the their fall off rate is 10 to 19%, but then 26%, I don't know. Ah, okay. A lot of people out there are saying, I don't know. 26% saying, I don't know. And what are the other answers? Uh, 10 to 19% has got 30% and then 20 to 29%. Yeah, yeah, and and the, the reality is that um, you you need to be tracking your fall off. Um, I was at an event at OpenView Venture Partners. Now it's probably about five years ago in Boston, and they had all their portfolio companies, and they have, uh, you know, they, they have real finance people and real uh, analytics uh, kind of wonks that are pulling the numbers from all the different portfolio companies on the cost per appointment. And one of the things the guy said it stuck with me. He goes. He said, it's not about the meetings you schedule, it's about the meetings that happen. So you take your total cost for everything that you have to pay for in order to, in order to get those meetings, which is inclusive of uh, marketing, sales development, overhead, et cetera. And then you divide it by the number of a completed first appointments you have. And at the time, the number for their portfolio was $731. And every one of them self-reported a number that was much lower. They thought their cost was like 400 bucks a meeting. But in fact, back then it was 731. It's probably over $900 now. Um, so why is this cost so much higher than people think? This is why you have meetings that fall off. So we're going to schedule meetings that stick. All right. First thing is asking for time versus telling for time. And there's really a confidence factor in how you do this. You know, you hear a lot of people who sound sort of 
uh, wimpy when they say things like, uh, David, um, I was hoping that uh, maybe we could sort of, you know, um, you know, get some time with you. No, no, I mean, I know you're busy right now, but maybe like next month or the month after, if that would be okay. We can't, we've got to avoid that kind of stuff. Instead, we've got to be very confident. So when I say ask for time versus telling for time, David, the purpose for the call is to find some time with you. It sounds like we have a great alignment with some of the issues that you're working on and how we could help you. Do you have your calendar in front of you? So the purpose for the call is to find some time with you. The reason for the call is to schedule something when I'm not catching you out of the blue. And saying it in a brief way where you have economy of words, it's nice and crisp and sharp, and most importantly, there's confidence along the way. Any comments on that uh, uh, topic there, going for time, telling for time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the promised land for for setting meetings really is having the person that you're talking to feel like they, they are uh, driving the meeting and they're taking real ownership of it because that's really what's going to make it stick. Now, that's really, really tough to do, obviously, and especially on a, a cold call or when you just catch somebody. But in the back of your head, try to think, how can I move this person? If you've ever read Trish Bertuzzi's book on sales development, how do I move this person from crazy busy to curious? Because if they're a little bit curious about what you're going to talk about and what they can learn, then they take more ownership over the meeting and they're kind of bought in more than just you trying to push the meeting because that's all about you. You want them to take ownership. So maybe your homework is to try to think about how can I get this person to become a little bit curious, want to accept the meeting, want to keep the meeting by feeling like they have some ownership over it. I have the best calls I've ever heard is, and it's funny actually in this particular call camp, the thing we're not talking about is how to have a good conversation to generate um, that that curiosity, which then turns into if the prospect asks for you for the meeting, even though you call them, they ask you for the meeting, that's really the best. And really the the, the ultimate is to build value for uh, what you're what you're going to be doing, build build value through the conversation. That's the, to the topic we're not quite talking about, but we'll get there. The second thing is the lost art of calendaring. Um, I, I, what I'm seeing right now is everyone's far too dependent on their calendar invites and, and a lot of times fall off just happens because logistically, like the calendar invite goes to spam, goes to the prospects junk folder. So I'll hear rescheduling calls that basically sound like this. Uh, yeah, David, um, you know, uh, the reason I was calling, we had a meet meeting last Tuesday, seeing if we can get that rescheduled. Oh, we did. I, I, yeah, I never got anything from you. Oh, you never got anything from me. Okay, and then they end up setting a calendar of, again. So what I'm recommending that you do, this is I hope one of your big takeaways from this call is have the prospect type it on their own calendar as a placeholder. Or alternatively, you could actually send a placeholder calendar invite in the moment and confirm that they actually received the email. So David, I'm gonna send you just an empty calendar invite. Can you please confirm you get that? I'll stand by, just let me know and have them look at their email until they go, yep, okay, just got it, good. Do me a favor, hit accept and send it back. And then later on, I'll fill in all the details, uh, like you know what web conferencing, like Zoom, we're gonna be using or whatever. Time zones, people fumble simple things like time zones. Always quote the time zones in the time. I just had one of my SDRs who was quoting time zones and, and didn't say uh, the time zone that it was in. They're quoting times without the time zone. The prospect got a little frustrated by that. What was it, Pacific, Eastern, Central? What, what are we dealing with here? And then listen for the typing that the prospect's actually typing it onto their calendar. That's a key. So David, let me know when you have your calendar ready. Great. Do me a favor. Put this in as a placeholder. Let me know when you're ready for the information. I'm ready. Okay, go ahead. My name is Steve, S-T-E-V-E. -E. So say it slowly. Allow them time to literally type it on their calendar. And then even better, you can use an agenda, uh, don't have them type the agenda on the calendar, but rather when you send the calendar invite, use the agenda. So bring back that calendaring, those logistics, that's so important. So David, moving on to the next topic, this is what we were just starting to broach here, is yeah. how do we create value for the meeting? So the calendar logistics and stuff, everything we just talked about, that's all well and grand, and that's gonna help you, by the way. I mean, that you could get five percentage points, 10 percentage points back on your fall off rate just by doing that stuff really, really well consistently. But the thing that's gonna take you from maybe, you know, 65% show up rate to 95% show up rate is the value that's created. What are some 
Uh, now, I'll, I'll set the table for this question a little bit, but I'm curious for, to hear from you. Uh, we're seeing a lot of companies that are bringing interesting offers to the table for what they're offering the prospect in the first scheduled interaction. Things like uh, our friends at Smart Recruiters, they have a, a hiring scorecard is what they call it. They sell basically HR hiring software to improve the candidate experience when they're applying for jobs. And they go secret shop your website and they basically, the, they when they secret shop your website, they, they can come back with a report that says, you know, your hiring experience stinks, your candidate experience stinks. Um, and they send you the scorecard. We've been doing conversation assessments at ExecVision where we secret shop uh, the sales line and record the calls and then deliver a two-page report against what they've been doing. So I'm just curious, what sort of things are you seeing companies offer now to try to build value for that meeting? Yes, this is great. And, and you know, I love the the sense of urgency uh, just on the on the last slide. I mean, the sense of urgency, I don't hear a lot sometimes. I mean, like you said, the confidence might not be there. I, I tell folks, I mean, try to get the meeting on the same day if you can, or you know, later in the day, and um, and get that get that calendar invite over, have them right on the phone. So I love that. Other quick thing, um, you know, timeanddate.com is a free service that can show you exactly where the uh, you know time zones are, and if you, you could have that up on a tab and just flip it over, go time and date up in the thing and find the exact time zone. So I always have that up, it's free. On yeah, this hey, one, Steve, quick, yeah, quick, go ahead. For Arizona, Indiana, and international destinations particularly because they have wacky ass rules during um, uh, uh, during daylight savings. But go ahead on this slide, please. Yeah, absolutely. So I've seen some great uh, offers and assessments um, is, is a great way to get your foot in the door because it's, it, like we said, it's giving them some value so that they're curious and they wanna jump on the call. So um, one thing that I do here at 10 Bound is um, if someone cold calls me, um, you know, I'll get the recording and um, and I'll reach out to the head of sales development or the head of marketing or the head of sales and go, hey, you know, I, I um, you know, got a call from one of your reps and um, there was definitely some great things here, but there's definitely some things that we could work on potentially. Uh, do you have, you know, a few minutes to uh, go over it with me? And And I mean, you know, you talk about curiosity. If you've ever run a sales development organization and had the VP of sales come up to you and go, you got your guys are sending this out or you guys are sending this out. I can't believe this. You know, you don't want to get a cart with your pants down. So you want that intel and that that helps to build some curiosity for the meeting. Um, I, the other one that I think of is um, InsideSales.com. They do the um, inbound lead uh, response audit, you know, so they'll they'll do a bunch of inbound uh, requests from different companies and then they'll come back and say, hey, you know, I we've got we've got the timing on yours and we'd really like to talk to you about it. So it's it's really offering something creative and there's gotta be something, everybody on the call has something creative that they can do um, to pique that curiosity and really make the meeting stick. Yeah, and you know, I, I work with some uh, tech companies that, you know, sell like tech hardware and software type stuff. They'll, they will dangle a uh, call with the solutions consultant uh, because that's actually viewed as being a very valuable thing to talk to a solutions consultant or a sales engineer. Uh, going back to InsightSales.com, another beautiful offer that they used to use all the time at Dreamforce is take a meeting with our CEO. And my old uh, friend and mentor, Ken Crow, uh, would talk about the trust ladder and how uh, it's if you're a buyer and someone says, hey, take a meeting with me as a salesperson, that's basically saying, hey, do you want to meet with a liar? As, and of course, we're not liars, but that's just the perception versus if someone says, hey, would you like to come and meet with our CEO? your probability of getting that meeting is much higher. And we've tested that over here, David. We've sent out messages where we'll send out the exact same message from one of our SDRs or inside sales reps at ExecVision, and we'll get, you know, whatever, whatever response rate it is, 8%. And we'll send that same message as me and our appointments, we, we go up to 24%, you know, we'll get an appointment as opposed to 8%. It's, it's dramatic who the message comes from. So don't just think in terms of what the offer is, also think about who's, providing that offer. If it's a call, obviously they can't pretend like they're Steve Richard, that would be fraud. All right, uh, let's move on to the next topic. <laughs> Steve, I, probably... I love that. I mean, the, you know, if you think about it, busy executives that you're trying to set these appointments with, you know, they, there's there's two things. They could look at the call on their calendar and go, oh, you know, this is gonna be uh, 30 minutes of somebody dragging me through a hundred different slides about their new thing. It's so boring. 
I, I, I need to get that time back so I can do other stuff. Or it's like, oh, the, you know, they, they're, they're going to bring this research. They're going to bring this assessment. They're going to bring some intel that I need to be able to do my job. So I'm going to keep this meeting. And shame on me if I don't reference uh, another another friend, Craig Kleeman, good old fashioned Craig Kleeman there with uh, oh. Craig and Clean with K. I'll tell you what he does a really good job of on this is the he they position an executive brief. So going back to that offers, they talk about executive briefs, and it's a it's an interesting you know it's an interesting approach, very interesting approach. All right, moving on, button up questions. Now um, th this this technique is designed to address the problem of if you're a sales professional, especially if it's an unscheduled, unexpected call, a cold call or a warm call to follow up on a lead or an event list or whatever. The problem is the salesperson wants to ask questions, right? But it's hard if you haven't earned the right to ask the questions because it's a cold call. Generally, you have to breadcrumb the prospect with smaller closed questions first before you earn the right to ask the big questions. And the fear is for the sales rep that they can talk themselves out of a meeting with too many questions. All right. So what we're doing here is we're saying, hey, flip the paradigm on its head. Instead, ask the questions after you've scheduled the appointment. We've also referred to this uh, as overtime questions. There's many different terms that I hear out there in the world of how people do this. It's genius. When we first saw someone doing it in our company, we were like, oh, that's a great idea. So here's, here's the ones that we recommend, and then David will get your take on this one. Um, now remember, we've already scheduled a meeting. David, uh, let's find some time. Great, look at the calendar, sounds good. Let me know you have your calendar. Do me a favor, type this in, I'll wait. Yep, Steve, Richard, it's exec vision, just like exec short, executive vision, good. Here's my phone number in case something comes up, good. Okay, David, before I let you go, in order to make the best use of your time, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? And I'd write down that verbatim. In order to make the best use of your time, do you mind if I ask you a couple of other questions? Just a few more questions. And almost everyone says yes. Um, some people refer to this as Columbo questions because there was an old detective in the 70s, Columbo. And he'd always, before he'd leave, he'd say, just one more question, just one more question. This is old guy with a trench coat. And then the questions that we've seen work particularly well in this context, but you can really ask anything you want, is first of all, who would feel left out if they weren't included? Or besides you, who else is involved in the decision? Now, the reason we ask that question is we're trying to get more people on the scheduled call, right? Um, here's what the research says. We've, we've got data in, our, in our, uh, our business that shows if you have two or more people on the call, it sticks at a greater than 20%, or sorry, greater than 90% rate. Versus if you have fewer than that, your stick rate's gonna be somewhere around the 75%. Great. So you get 15 percentage point stick rate just by getting multiple people on the same call, which makes sense. Because David, to your point before, if the executive's looking at their calendar, like, oh boy, here we go. If they've got their direct report on the call already, someone's probably going to show up, if not both of them. They're not going to blow off that because they already committed with their colleagues. So that's the first one. Second one, what's your biggest challenge with blank right now? Get Now you get to ask the big open-ended question, the you know, spin selling question, situation, problem, implication, need payoff. Here's the problem question. It's kind of, you know, it's not easy to ask an implication question in a cold call. You should certainly be asking about problems, challenges, goals, what they're trying to accomplish, that kind of stuff. Asking about business impact is probably too soon. And then three, this is a fun one, try to get their cell phone number. It's amazing how well this works. A lot of people prefer that I send them a text message the day up to confirm. And think about all these in terms of probability. Are you gonna get the cell phone number every time? Heck no, absolutely not. But if you ask that question consistently, it's actually not a question, notice there's no question mark. A lot of people prefer social proof, not John Barrows and, and influence. A lot of people prefer that I send a text message day up to confirm. People prefer texts, who doesn't? Oh yeah, that's a good idea, here's my cell phone number. And then you give them the cell phone number. All right, so I'm just curious, David, what do you think of this framework? And more importantly, are there other things that you've heard people ask in that button-up period after they get the meeting? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple things. One is that if you take anything away from the webinar, get multiple people on the call because you're you're leveraging social proof. It's exactly that situation that Steve said. If they go on there and they see, especially you know, folks on their team or, or cross departmentally that there's going to be at least one or two other people on the call, they will have a, 
obligation, you know, as part of the company to be on there. If it's just one person, you're really leaving yourself open to it. So do whatever you can to get more people on the line. You know, the other thing is that uh, people have a tendency to um, rush through their day and f feel like once they set this meeting on the SDR side that they're done. And they're just like, I'm done. Now I can go move on to something else. So number one, get that text message, but also in the back of your mind, realize this is just the first step of the meeting. You've got to assume that the meeting is going to be canceled mm. and take that. I know it's kind of a negative, the power of negative thinking <laughs> instead of the power of positive thinking, but we tend to get rose colored glasses because we sent the, the calendar invite, they accepted and we're like, cool, I'm done. Yeah, see you guys next Thursday. No way, man. That is the beginning of the process. You got to get that text message. You you, you got to put a, a, a calendar reminder for yourself a couple of days before the meeting to call them, make sure they're going to be on the meeting, call them the day before, you know, remind them, leave them a voicemail, email them, text them. I mean, you got to stay right on top of them because otherwise, if they forget all about you, again, rushing from meeting to meeting, they've, they've, they've got, you know, a lot of different priorities. They see that pop up, no value, delete. And then you're done. So. Amen. Amen to that. And, and, you know, of course, connect with them on LinkedIn, assuming you have a credible profile. And if you don't have a credible profile, we've Jamie Shanks has a social selling course for you. Um, but, you know, these things are all these things are all important. You, you know, delivering uh, David, of course, uh, sending content. Out. What, what do you have? Do you know of any research or data? I don't about, um, you know, sending content prior to a meeting and having the meeting stick at a higher rate. Yeah, I mean, I don't have anything offhand, but uh, you know, it couldn't hurt. It, it, you know, the, the, a lot of times you think that uh, you send out the email and they just get that one email for the day, and you know, that's all that they have. And so you you send out this great piece of content and you go, wow, that's really going to make a huge difference. You got to understand that's one of probably a hundred emails that came in that day, and so it can't hurt if they go on and they click it and they look at it. But the main thing is. I, I I feel like when setting up a meeting, it's like you got a fish on the line, and if there's any fishermen out there, fisher women, um, you got a fish on the line. You're getting a little bit of a tug. That's the that's the initial meeting set, even if they accept the calendar invite. But you still there's a lot of subtlety in reeling it in, and that's sending out like to your point, Steve, sending out the content, texting them, keeping in touch with them at least two more times before the actual meeting goes. Beautiful. Sam, what do we got for questions? What do we got for ideas? What do, what do we got? What are people saying? So they're starting to come in now. This question is actually from our friend Ed Porter. Ah. He wants to know what our findings are about how far out does how far out can you schedule a meeting before it drastically starts to fall off? Yeah, we're seeing two weeks. We actually have that data over here. Thanks to our great Kristen Bazaar who pulls it uh, now Kristen McNally. She um, so if it, if it's within the first week, I can't. I wish I had should have brought this right in front of me. But there's basically a a pretty nasty fall off between one week one, week two is not terrible, week three is pretty bad. After a month, you might as well have not bothered. It's like goes down to like 30% or 20%. So get the meeting as fast as as soon as you can. That's exactly what David said before. The data proves that. What else we got? Anything else? Yeah, and Steve, if I could just chime in. I mean, if you, anybody out here follows Gary V, we, we live in an attention economy. I mean, the attention is becoming the most precious resource. And so for God's sake, people, if you have their attention, if they're replying, if they, they're on the line, urgency, you got it. You got to get something locked in. And then there's the old saying, time kills deals. It's the same with meetings. If it's more than, I mean, you know, in 2019, I think if it's more than like two or three days out or uh, a week at the most, then you're really getting into dangerous territory. And it sounds like the data proves that out, Steve. So. And try to get the, the even the meeting day over the next day. And I, I lead that by saying, hey, look, a lot of people I talk to have stuff that falls off last minute. Any chance you got something open tomorrow? You know, how about four, yes. four or five Pacific tomorrow? What does that look like? Yeah, it, it's shocking how often people are like, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, let's go ahead and just knock this out now if they're interested. It'll be there. Anything else coming in, yep. Sam? We've also got what's the sweet spot for sending meeting reminders? How many touch points do you need to do that? Is it the day before, yeah. hours before? What works best? Okay, so uh, so David, you hear that sweet yep. spot for sending reminders? I know Kevin Dorsey's done some data on this, and I believe, if I remember correctly, that he had a three touch point plan leading up to the meeting, and I don't know 
why he came up with that or the specific data, the research he had. But do you know anything about the exact number is the right number, Dave, David? Well, what I go off of is what demand force does. If anybody has um, you know, made a dental appointment or a medical appointment in the last couple of years, <laughs> Um, everybody out here, at least, they use a company called Demand Force, which which um, is a practice software that ensures that people show up for the appointments. And literally, dude, I mean, I get like two emails, two text messages, a phone call. You know, I mean, I'm like blowing up a week before the meeting, and I would follow the same thing. I think they're onto something. That you, I would say, um, you know, if we're gonna look at it uh, sy systemically, I would say one email two days before, one email the day before, at least one to two phone calls the week before to get the person on the line and reconfirm the meeting. And then if you get the text message, send them one to two text messages before. You, you gotta, I mean, I know this sounds extreme, but I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a founder CEO with four employees and I get blown up all the time. So you imagine what these, VPs and you know higher level people are dealing with they're dealing with uh, hundreds of inputs every day so you, you got to raise above the noise. David, you want to know the funniest thing ever since uh, Exec Vision we got a round of financing we we announced back in uh, December uh, from our friends at Edison in New Jersey. Ever since then, the suspect the volume has gone up significantly. But here's the funny thing, and everyone pay attention when I say this: nobody calls, nobody calls. I get more email with all due respect our friends at sales loft and outreach because their tools are fantastic but i get sequenced and cadenced emails up the yin yang uh you know same with insightsales.com dial source I and mean, everybody's got their own kind of email sequence and cadencing platform going out and they're great but people are just sending more they just they just drop me in their sequences and cadences and people aren't picking up the damn phone to call me and i've got my cell phone number listed right on linkedin i get five times more buyers that call me than sellers it's unbelievable Unbelievable. I, I completely agree. It's a, it's a, the channel's being ignored. And on the flip side, I get tons of calls every day on my cell phone, but they all hang up and, <laughs> and they don't leave a voicemail. <laughs> so I tell people, for the love of God, every time you call, leave a voicemail. They're not going to call you back, but leave a voicemail with your name, your phone number, the name of the company, and why you're calling and um, leave it on there because I'd say, 20, 30 calls, nobody leaves a voicemail. I pick up the phone, there's nobody there. You know, so it's like, what I'm the hell is going on here, people? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna give it, it seems like there's a lot of theme around insidesales.com research today. Um, there was a great research study that Ken Crow did um, several years ago that showed that, you know, how few people leave voicemails and the sweet spot for the number of voicemails is two. You want to leave two voicemails during any period at which you're trying to pursue that person for an appointment. Usually that should last 30 days. It should not last longer than 30 days because you're putting good after after bad, unless it's a most wanted account or most wanted contact. Um, so two voicemails, absolutely, you should lose them. You use them and then just to set your expectations, you can increase your callback rate from maybe a, a 2% or a 1% on voicemails to 5%. So it's not huge, but what it does is it has a dramatic impact on your email reply by leaving a voicemail. So you should be leaving voicemails, people. Uh, shame on all of us for sort of giving up just because we got programmed and thinking they don't work. That's not necessarily true. Just because the voicemail isn't getting a call back doesn't mean it's not working. It might get an email reply. Tweet us at call camp. I think we're on a real calls, right? You ready? Do we have one more? We've got- One more. Two more. All right. Pick between the ones. Two more, do them, quick. How do I convince my boss to track our fall off rates or how do I track my fall off rate or should you try and have the conversation with the prospect instead of pushing them off to another meeting? Okay, so I'm gonna take them in reverse order. I'm just gonna answer that first one first. It depends on, or sorry, the second one first. Should I have a conversation with the prospect while I have them on the phone versus scheduling an appointment? And I've got some, some of our customers right now that are wrestling with that exact same topic. Um, it depends on what you're selling and who you're selling to. In the vast majority of complex sales situations where the solution price is more than about you know, 10,000 bucks, it's gonna be better to schedule it later so that the buyer has context. For um, if you're selling something that's more transactional and especially if you're selling to someone who doesn't really control their day by a calendar, they're not very good at calendaring things in certain industries, that's what it's like. They, they just don't operate that way. You have to just catch them in order to have the conversation because they don't keep a Gmail or an Outlook calendar. 
So that's my answer for that. And you're going to have to test. I'm always going to say test. You're going to have to test to see what works for you. Hang on. What was the other one? I want to get the other one, one is how do I track my fall off rate and what do I need to bring to my boss to get them to track our fall off rate? David, how are people tracking fall off rate? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm old school, so I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but uh, a piece of paper and a pen. <laughs> but you could, uh, you know, pull up a Google Excel sheet if you want to get really fancy and um, and just discipline yourself to go through it once a week and go, OK, this one, this one hit, this one fell off, this one hit, you know, gather up a couple weeks of data and then go into your boss and say, look, I mean, we're, we're, we're running about a 60 percent show rate. Um, can you help me to set up a report? that will um, put this across the team so we can really track it. Yeah, love, love Chili Piper and Time Trade. Those, those kinds of, that category of solution helps for this. We actually track it in Salesforce. We created a separate, uh, what we call exec vision meetings object. So anytime we have, uh, we, we find that the functionality of the events object uh, or events is one of the activities in, in Salesforce is pretty limited and in whatever CRM you're in. So we created a custom object for it. So we track things like, um, date scheduled, time scheduled, how it was scheduled, if it was phone, if it was uh, email, social, um, or some combination. We track um, uh, if the meeting occurred ver versus if the meeting moved to rescheduled, so we can very easily pull reports of the percentage of fall off. So, if, you know, if you want to get a little more sophisticated than, than paper and pen, but there is nothing wrong, by the way, with a whiteboard on the wall. I mean, what David's saying is exactly right. That's how we started. We started with Excel spreadsheets and Google, now Google Sheets and a, and a whiteboard on the wall. Um, but now we've got it to a point where it's all pretty clean and automated within the CRM. Are we good? We're good. There's a bunch of other questions, but I'm going to get those answered in another way. Look at this. People are asking questions. We'll do. I'll do these calls quick, and we'll go back to the discussion. They're liking it. All right. Now, by the way, every one of these calls, we are going to jump in mid-course to probably around the stage where the where the where the rep asks for time. Okay, so just know you're not hearing the whole call. Every single one of these was unscheduled, unexpected. Um, uh, they were pure cold calls, and uh, you know, like this is a six-minute, thirty-second cold call, and you're going to hear he books a meeting here. Again, through the inbox to see, okay, what piece of material can I use? Um, and so, because deals are falling through the cracks, we're starting to do and do a favor. Hey, David, is that pretty pretty quiet on your side? We could we could turn it up just a bit. Okay, let me let me play with this. It's a cool little Chrome extension, by the way, everyone called Volume Booster. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna turn it up and let me just do this so I don't blast everybody's eardrums out. All right, everyone, be prepared on your speakers to turn them up or down because I don't want to you know damage your eardrums. Here we go. Checking out that effective content so that reps uh, have the most updated, fresh information. When they're in front of buyers, they're not falling at deaf ears or talking to a room where people are texting, you know, instead of actually listening, answering questions. Um, but hey, Tom, I, I didn't know if you were in front of the calendar here, but I was actually running off to a meeting, but I'd love to loop you in on some of this work here. You know how you were looking at uh, first week of, uh, of August, looking at that Wednesday. A little long-winded, but are you know didn't know if you're in front of your calendar. How are you looking for the first week of August? Now I'd like to see him crisper on that, but again, you're hearing more of a guiding the prospect to the calendar, telling for the meeting as opposed to asking for the meeting. Uh, mind if I would circle back with you then? Yeah, sure. You can circle back on the first week of August. That that should be fine. Um, is there any particular day that you were thinking of? Yeah, I was uh, shooting for uh, Wednesday. Um, I'd you have some time here in the morning, and I know you're, uh, you're on the Pacific Coast, but uh, would uh, something like nine? Good job. So now he's quoting time zones in the prospects time. That's good. Are you AM working for you? Yeah, that should be fine. Okay. Cool. So, and uh, what's the best email address I can send over a uh, calendar invite and hold that time for us for a little bit? Now he asked for the email. I'm going to skip that just in the name of confidentiality. All right. Kind of what we'd expect to hear at this stage of the game. Hang on, dial it back in. And, and things like that. Um, are you guys BYOD or I imagine that you guys can Hang on one second, I want to. Yep. And, there we uh, go. And also, um, you mentioned that some of your apps have iPads and, and things like that. Um, are you guys BYOD or I imagine that you guys have, you know, some of those devices for that? Um, okay, so now we're at the part of the call that we refer to as those button up questions that I mentioned last time. All right. Um, here's what we didn't hear. What I didn't hear. Rich do in this call. So uh, actually, I'm going to use Keenan's observe, describe, prescribe framework because that's what I've been 
I'm teaching everybody how to do, and that's what I, I've, I've been taught to do. So what Rich does here is he says, I'm going to send a calendar invite. That's what happens. Now, if I'm coaching Rich on this, I'm going to say, Rich, what could you do to decrease the, the likelihood of fall off? And ideally, I can get Rich to conclude for himself, boy, I probably should have said, um, can you put a placeholder on your calendar in case that calendar invite goes to junk? Let me know when you're ready to type the info. So you hear that language? Let me know when you're ready to type the info. That's what I would have loved to have heard here. Because again, if the person types it on their own calendar, the probability of that meeting sticking goes up. You can still send the calendar invite and let the two things be side by side. But just by virtue of the fact that they put it on their own calendar in their own typing dramatically increases the likelihood. From there, we move to the, to the button up part. So now we're in the button up questions, the overtime questions, if you will, right? So now we say, he says to him, he's, he's asking about, um, are the devices that your salespeople have, bring your own device. So there's certain questions that he wanted to have answered around the number of salespeople and also questions around um, whether or not the salespeople each have their own devices that are really critical qualification points for the call. So here's a great opportunity to ask in the, you know, in the language of spin selling, situation, problem, implication, need payoff, here's a great chance to ask a situation question, which Rich does. He's asking situation questions about background info. He's not jeopardizing his meeting. I got word. And we, we are sending the devices directly to reps. I mean, to be honest, our, our materials aren't that real time. I mean, we, what, what we market off of is, is clinical data, which doesn't really and what you can see here is not only does the prospect talk for, you know, almost a minute, but he also, you heard the tone of voice change say, our marketing materials aren't that up to date here on how we're doing things. And that's a pain point. That's a problem that he's identified that he can later, he can later exploit in, in the, the call and the schedule call. So here's, that. this is the, the, the crux of the idea is if you're able to get the appointment first, then you ask the questions after you secure the appointment, the probability of that appointment goes up dramatically, you get much more information to make it a better use of time. And oh, by the way, if you want to uh, disqualify it, you're in the driver's seat as the rep. David, what, what, what are you hearing here? Any thoughts? Yes, I mean, I, it's brilliant because first we lay down that we're going to have the meeting and then we fill it in because if you try to reverse it, I, you can you can blow the meeting right on the call. Um, I, I So the, the, the brilliant, brilliant uh, suggestions. And I would just say, um, you know, tighten it up a little bit like uh, he, it sounds really good. He got the meeting. So uh, but, uh, you know, get 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 to the point a little bit faster. Uh, while you have the guy, because you you don't want to, if you start to bumble it a little bit, then uh, you might lose him. That's exactly right. You got to get to the point faster. And we call it economy of words. Fewer yeah. words. Maybe I need some more economy of words in this webinar. All right, let's go to Kanika. <laughs> so much money. <laughs> well, actually, Gaines, we work with numerous community banks, and you're space to grow and diversify their loans. Like um, like you mentioned, how you guys are looking into um, a CNI lender. But the reason I'm actually reaching out today is we are hosting an event coming up in the spring. And I'd like to find some time when I'm not catching, it, catching you out of the blue to share some information about that with you and see if you'd be interested in attending. If you have uh, some time tomorrow, we could reconnect and I could share that with you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to. I've got some things on my plate right now. I'm really going to be tied up. All right. So, David, observe, describe, prescribe. What did we hear here that was different and interesting than the other call? Well, I, I thought it's it started off great. I mean, she it was very um, it was loose, confident. I love the the tone. Um, I think where it could have gotten okay. Wait a minute. I uh, observe. I observe that. Prescribe. Yeah. I would say. Um, what what's the value to him to attend the meet, the event? I think that's where we got lost because it's basically just I want to have you come to this event, and if I hear that, I I think, uh, God, you know, I I got a million things in my hand right now. Like I I got all this stuff. I can't go to some event. But if there was some reason to go that she mentioned, she could have just popped that in, and it would have been a lot stronger. I think. 
that I, I completely agree. So the, the the purpose for having this call on Call Campus because it's a it's a good example of changing the offer. Now, interestingly enough, what Kanika is doing is she's basically scheduling time with him to talk about the value of the event that's happening in the spring. So it would be nice to hear her say, hey, the purpose for the call is we've got this event going on in the spring. It's going to be attended by people like blank and blank or real, a real true group of your peers. And we're, on, we're going to be talking about this topic. Can we find some time to fill you in the rest of your team in on the, the agenda and then see if you want to join us? Yeah, I mean, you know, and this is a social proof thing, I think, for events. It's it's the 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 quick value that you can throw in there is we're going to have people from, you know, some of the top companies and really high level people that you want to rub elbows with. And if, if that if that triggers them to want to attend the event so that they can rub elbows with some of the top people in the industry, then that's enough. I mean, and that's just, you know, just a few words to throw in there where that to, again, curiosity is what we're trying to do. Make him a little bit curious, like, huh, that sounds interesting. Now's not a great time. Hey, let's set up a meeting. I'll go through the whole agenda with you, what we're going to do and why it would make a you know valuable use of your time. Funny story. When I was at the corporate executive board back in uh, 2002, um, I learned this from a woman there named Liz Crowder, who's now Liz Cho, and she had a one sentence email. Now, granted, they were selling a, a research executive membership, a research-based executive membership. So it was sort of a council of chief information officers in this case. So her email was, ready for it? David, may I have 30 minutes of your time to introduce you to the working council for CIOs? Thanks in advance, Liz. And then below, nice. below her name, Liz, she listed 500 names of CIO members that we were allowed to publish. It was unbelievable how effective that worked, right? Because it offers wow. completely different. You're introducing someone to their peers, basically, even though you're not directly, you're kind of indirectly. But anyway, the offer of the event, he says, yes, we'll play a little bit more of this one, then we'll move on. Awesome. Uh, oh, halfway through November, can you just okay. kind of put me down for some time that third week of November? Uh, I'll speed I it up. can absolutely do it for the week of the 12th. Get your calendar open, we can pick a time right now that you have open. Uh, what's you for, what is, uh, what's Thursday of that week? Uh, the 15th. I'll let you for that. I love the do you have your calendar open? Great, great, great. But we still want her to do what? We want her to say, can you type it in as a placeholder? It's the one thing we keep yes. hearing missing. Okay, and the specific time you had in mind my day. Yeah, you picked a good time. <laughs> <laughs> when you catch me after four o'clock, that's probably the best shot. So let's do uh -huh. that after four o'clock. Okay, how about we shoot for, you're in central, correct? Yes. Okay, let's do 4 p.m. Central on the 15th. Okay, that sounds fun. Okay, great. And just to uh, make sure, Gaines, uh, this is the best number to reach you. Oh, yeah. Well, no, not really. Uh, I'm very and she says, rather than doing the whole, a lot of people prefer I text them, she says, is this the best number to reach you? And his answer to that is, no, not really. And I'm going to skip the part where he gives his cell phone number. So that's another good way to do that. 3819, is this your cell phone? Yes. Okay, perfect game. So I am going, and um, actually, could you uh, tell me your email? Because I, I just want to send you over a calendar invite just so I'm built for account. All right, but what we don't have is we don't have where she says, in order to make the best use of your time, is there anybody else who would feel left out? Or besides you, who else would be interested in this topic? That's a great way to ask to get other people involved. So she gets the cell phone number, which is fantastic. I'd love to see her ask about other things like that. David, any comments here? Yeah, and and right there would be he's he's a friendly guy. I mean, is it okay if I text you like a couple of days before, just sort of as a reminder? Um, you know, get get permission. I, I nobody wants to get a text unsolicited, but if they if they say it's okay. Um, you know, it's just another touch point that, that will remind them to jump on the call. Yeah. And then the other button up question that we didn't hear her ask is, and this is a perfect time. I mean, this guy is going to talk, right? She decided to, to end the call, not him, um, is, hey, what's your biggest challenge with blank right now? Or what's a, you know, what's a key priority or a key objective for you in the next quarter? Something that your team and you are working on right now. This is an opportunity to start the discovery process. And I did a, um, I, I did a, a, a keynote 
at the sales kickoff down at Avalara in North Carolina and Durham, North Carolina last week. And uh, he asked me, to, asked me to come speak. It was 12 habits of highly effective SDRs. One of the habits is from my friend, Chris Corcoran. Uh, he's the guy who founded Memory Blue. And he talks about how the best sales development reps will outqualify their peers. You know, start taking the ball a little bit further down the field in the qualification process to get more questions answered, especially now that you have this button up period, there's sort of no excuse. Ask more questions, uncover some challenges and pain points, even though it's a cold call. I love it. So everyone's homework is uh, you go on YouTube and look up Columbo. He is a classic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if they have him on Netflix, but um, he, yeah, like Steve said, he's from the the uh, the old school of um, you know he always just had one more question while I have you one more question you know, and uh, that's what you got to do because that that was a great point that Chris brought up um, you know as much qualification as you can after you've set the meeting. So. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great. Out qualify everyone. All right, here we go with Tyler. And Tyler can ask a a, a really neat qualifying question here. Mr. Kyle, I got a meeting coming up here in about four minutes myself. Uh, what I was just trying to do was find a better time, either you know, later this week or next week, and add a you know, quick 15 minutes. Just wake up and you know, talk more like we're doing now, just to see if Key Tech is something that could help you guys out in the future if you start to look that direction. Um, you know, the I, I'd love to learn more about it, um, mm -hmm. but those you know, those decisions are happening, you know, mm -hmm. at the. Uh, in the corporate office um, at a much higher level. Um, and I know that in the past we've had, uh, you know, we've been very selective with using any sort of third party services um, versus, um, you know, creating things internally. Um, so if you want to send me an email, um, you know, then we could try to schedule something. Now we're hearing the classic, hey, those decisions are made at corporate. I'm not involved in those decisions. I am interested in the topic. Why don't you go ahead and send me an email? We will hear how Tyler does a very adept job of turning that into a meeting. But David, the thing that I didn't do is, what when whenever someone says those decisions are made by other people, what should you always ask? Yeah, um, you know, if you feel comfortable bringing them in um, and you see value here, let, let's uh, let's rope them in. <laughs> you know, um, you know, depending on what the what the tone of voice is like for the person you're talking to. What do you there think? Is, there was no real reason why we he couldn't have tried to rope in the other people. Who are they? I mean, quite simply, just say, okay, great. Now those people at corporate, who are those people that make these decisions? This is a simple question to ask. Who are those people? who make these decisions besides you. I heard of one person many years ago when I was doing a sales training program, she said, besides you, who else is involved in the decision? I love that question because it's not cutting out this person and making them feel like they're small and they're somehow not involved. All right, yeah, let's hear and, and Steve, um, just a last quick note on that is, uh, you know, that, that, that could make people feel a little bit defensive and a little bit uncomfortable on the phone line. So that is something that you, you need to practice. I mean, rope somebody in, rope in your friend, rope in your boss, rope in another, you know, sales rep and practice that in a very subtle way, because it's like a, it's like a key to unlocking way better success in the meeting. If you can ask that question in a way that doesn't offend the person or turn them off, but makes them feel like a partner with you, you see the value, let's go grab those other people, set up the meeting and get this done so we can help you instead of like, oh, okay, well, who else is involved, you know? So, yeah. subtlety. Yeah, yeah. Miller, Miller Hyman talks about developing a coach. You wanna have that person be your coach, your advocate on the same side of the table as you. There's even a guy named Ian Altman that wrote a book, book called Same Side Selling, where you're getting you know, some, someone or multiple people at the buyer to be on your side. All right, let's keep going and hear how Tyler pivots it into a meeting. That way, um, but I do have, you know, the next uh, the next couple of weeks are are really busy for me in the store with a number of different things going on. Um, but mm -hmm. I think email correspondence would be would be best. Ideal, of course, of course. I'd be happy to do that there, Kyle. What's the best that making with your guys training now okay so now he just got the email address and now we're going to hear after the email address how he transitions it in 
And this is kind of clever how he does this because what he does is he sort of assumes the meeting and transitions to a very good button up question. I'm for you off the top of your head, Kyle, you know, if you could flip a magic wand and, you know, change anything about your guys' training or, you know, add any e-content to your guys' training, you know, what direction would you take it? There it is. Now, it's cliche. Credit Bob Perkins on this one because I learned it from him and and we use it and it works. Um, a little, 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 bit, little bit of a hokey move, but the whole, if you had a magic wand and you could like, you could change anything about blank and let blank be a topic, don't let blank be like a, you know, a solution. So blank is not about features, but rather if you could change anything about how you guys review your calls for training and coaching purposes. In this case, anything you'd like to train about your uh, change about your training, what would it be? Magic wand question. Anything to add there, David? Yeah, I mean, I you know, the, the, those cliched ones, I still use them. I still use what keeps you up at night. Um, I'll probably I'll, <laughs> I'll probably get uh, get slammed in the comments, but I, I, I like it. I mean, I, I know it's kind of a cliche question, but if you could wave a magic wand is I use that all the time. And it's great because it, it takes the pressure out of the conversation and they can just kind of, you know, instead of trying to paint them into a corner on a meeting, you're you're letting the, the pressure out of the room and they could kind of go off a little bit. The more that they talk, the more information you can get, the better the meeting's going to be. And my mentor, Tom Snyder, I love this line. Everyone, you should write this down and live by it because boy, does it work. People value more what they conclude for themselves than what they're told. So by yes. virtue of him saying this, and you can see it on the waveform, right? You see when Tyler's talking here and asks that, if you could wave a magic wand, what does he do? He ends up talking for another, you know, 45 seconds. And oh, by the way, I'm not going to play this because there is some sensitive stuff here. He talks about his vision for a solution. He talks about his buying criteria. You know, so he's now he's talking about what ideally he'd want his training solution to look like. And oh, by the way, it aligns beautifully with what Tyler is is uh, representing here. So I'm going to jump ahead past that. We'll put, listen to the rest of this and then wrap her up. That side of things. Um, just while I have you, I know you mentioned the next few weeks are busy here. I'm going to go ahead and jump out on a limb here, Kyle, and assume you get a million and one emails a day. Uh, tell you what, I'll send you that email you know, with all that content top of mind for you. I know you mentioned you were busy for the next upcoming few weeks here. Uh, would you mind if we just set a time to reconnect in you know, early July, just so I can see what you thought of yeah. the email and thought of the information? Yeah. yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. After the 4th of July, you got it. Tell you what, you want to look ahead to uh, I'm And then I'll, I'll pause it there because there's not much else value. So you, what you're hearing in these calls is you're hearing the, the, these reps that are getting pieces of what David and I just covered in the content in terms of, you know, using an offer, a compelling offer, making the meeting a valuable use of time uh, in the challenger sale and challenger customer they famously described they say would the prospect be willing to pay for the appointment is it such a good use of time that the prospect would be willing to pay for the appointment are are they doing the calendaring logistics stuff which we see you know just tighten that up and you'll get yourself a five to ten percent bump on your show up rate just having the prospect type it on their own calendar if they have an executive assistant calling and confirming the meeting with the executive assistant cleaning up the calendar invite so that it's something that makes sense and the executive assistant will make sure the prospect shows up to if they have that, or if it's in person, the right address. I can't tell you how many times in my career I've gone to a wrong address, and then later on I had a little conversation with whoever booked it. Also, when I was in SDR, I sent people to wrong addresses, so it happens. We just have to learn from our mistakes. And then moving into those, uh, moving into those button-up questions, who else uh, would feel left out if they weren't included, or besides you, who else is involved? Um, a lot of people prefer that I send them a text or you can just say, hey, uh, can I text you that day to remind you? You know, I won't abuse your cell phone other than that. And then the big challenge question, what's your biggest issue? What's your biggest challenge with blank, with whatever that thing is that they're dealing with? All right, more discussion. What, what What's coming in, Sam? Sam's all eager to ask your questions for you. There's so many good <laughs> questions today. Like, awesome job, audience. Thank you, guys. So one of the really interesting ones I want to know the answer of is, do you see a difference between the prospect having to dial into a bridge or you calling them on their direct line? Boy, I would love to do the research on that because I, I do believe there is a difference. I don't actually have pure data to, to prove it. 
Um, but, but what we're seeing is almost always, not almost always, but a high percentage of the time, if you have a dial-in bridge, you have to send an email that says, now here's the subject line for the email, and this works almost every time. Are you still good to talk? And then it says, um, David, we're on the bridge, no rush. Let, let, let us know if you got pulled into something. And you, and you put the bridge information right there, the Zoom link and the dial-in, so it makes it easy for them to do it. But, but you're right, I think I'm, I'm seeing a much higher show up rate when you call the person directly. What we haven't played with is being on the Zoom bridge and then dialing somebody into the Zoom bridge. Uh, David, do you know anything about that? Are you any actual hardcore data or experience? No data, but I, I think um, you wanna put the person's cell phone in the calendar invite. You wanna put your cell phone in the calendar invite and, and have the bridge. So there's just so many multiple different ways. And as soon as five minutes go by, you email them, put in the, like Steve said, and then start calling them on their cell and try to get them because maybe they're messing around with the bridge. They can't figure it out. It's downloading. You get them on their cell. You go, okay, are we doing this? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, good. Let's, let's go, you know, okay. um, make it super easy for them because they might be in their car driving. They might be at the airport. They might be at their kid's soccer game. You want to make it as easy as possible and be proactive as possible and just get them on the line. Yeah. By the way, everyone, I'm just keeping up this uh, sales development conference, shameless promotion for David's <laughs> event, which I, again, I keep hearing very, very good things about. Um, so check it out, go to 10 bound and you'll find the conference there. Uh, Sam, fire us off the next one here. How long do you wait to give up on a meeting? How long do you wait to give up on a meeting? Um, while you're on the bridge. While you're on the bridge, 10 minutes. David, how long do you wait on a bridge before you give up? I mean, it depends. If it's somebody like that, that guy, the last one that we're thinking of where he was pretty, he was pretty shaky to begin with. Um, yeah, a shorter time, but if it's a, you know, bigger, bigger time prospect, I'll give them, you know, sometimes I've been on there for half an hour, just yeah. praying and calling and texting and going, please. Um, so yeah, I guess it just depends how big, how big they are and how much time you have. Trust me. Are you still good to talk? Yeah. Question mark. And that it's it, it really, that, that we've tested a bunch of things. That one works the best, but yeah, I know that's a, that's good, good advice. Um, and then remember when you, when you reschedule that meeting, and you just move the calendar invite. If it went to spam the first time, it's gonna to go to spam the second time. So get the person to put it on their calendar to make sure, or alternatively have them send you an email and then reply to it so you don't go to junk. If for whatever reason you're going to the junk folder. What else we got? In terms of value offers, do you have any good suggestions for zero cost offers? Zero cost offers, um, any, any sort of uh, consultation, introducing the person to a peer. Here's a simple zero cost offer. Actually, I'm gonna do this with someone in Austin that I'm selling to right now. I'm gonna get them over to our two customers that I was visiting with recently in Austin. So, so if you can have them, if you can set up a customer field trip, it's a way for your prospect to see how, you know, one of your customers is using your product or service in the real world. If they happen to be in the same geography, if you come into Exec Vision, you'll see we have a map just sitting there on the floor with pins in it with every one of our customers that we get. Eventually we'll buy like a map anything to enable this but for right now we're doing an analog and it's great. If one of us is flying to you know, Salt Lake City, Utah, bam, we can see all of our customers we can visit with at the same time. So customer field trips are free, everybody. And by the way, that comes from Todd Frederick, uh, the guy who built Aperture and sold it to Dell for $2 billion. He's much smaller, smarter than me, so you should pay attention. The field trips do work. Dude, this, this webinar is worth $2 billion. I mean, I'm just, I'm absolutely blown away, Steve. I mean, Steve is a scholar of this um i mean you've given me so many resources i just want to send a props out to all the sdrs and bdrs and all the different things and the sales reps that are doing this on a daily basis because this is tough and you really i mean to take it to the level where steve is you become a scholar in this you can make a lot more money open a lot more doors use these ideas these are these are absolutely fantastic amen amen one more sam final question final when you send so many meeting reminders. Don't you risk the run, or don't you risk increasing your fall off? How many is too many? Great. So here's the answer to the question, because you heard David's extreme answer before. Test it for you and your prospects. Some prospects will require 10, and that will have the highest probability of success. For some of them past three, you have a negative impact on your stick rate, on your show up rate. So you have to test it because it depends on your buyer, what you're selling and who you're selling to. 
Yeah, right. and I, I would say just I'm going to go out on a limb again. As a rule of thumb, send more reminders than you are now, especially if, if your stick rate sucks. Um, increase it a little bit and see if you get a better stick rate because um, we're just not doing it enough right now. And it's a war. there's a war for attention out there, people. I mean, honestly, you get you got to get in front of them. David, I appreciate what you're doing for our profession with 10 bound. Keep up the good work. And what's our next call camp, Sam? Do I Next month on the 21st, we're talking sales enablement with Roger Jefferson. Ah, this is an interesting one because I've heard so many sales enablement ones that are all about like what sales enablement is. And I challenged Roderick and I said, hey man, I don't want another one of those. I want to see real sales enablement templates. I want to see people's sales processes. I want to see battle cards. I want to see the questions you ask the business. I want to see the real stuff that you're doing. So we're not going to be doing real calls next time. But we're going to be like basically you know, breaking down the game tape, quote unquote, of sales enablement, which is essentially tools, templates, and documents. All right, nothing else. Everyone, have a great day. David, you're the man. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I really appreciate it and look forward to doing one of these again. This was a lot of fun. All right, take care.